this video, we'll be discussing social media and social networks. Now, I could go into detail on current popular social media sites and the specifics of how they work and function. But the problem with that approach is that social media networks change so rapidly that by the time you graduate, you'd be looking at a completely different landscape of social media services. It was only a few years ago that sites like Vine, MySpace, and Dig were leaders in their respective areas, but are now almost non-existent. Great example of this rapid change pace is that in your textbook, it still refers to Google Plus as a current social media provider, when Google Plus stopped operations in 2019. So instead of looking at specific social media providers or sites, in this video, we're going to be focusing on how businesses use social media in general to accomplish their goals and gain competitive advantage. I should also note that this video is part one of two on chapter nine. This video will cover social media, while part two will cover e-commerce and will be posted at a later date. But before we get into that, as always, there are some required readings. Before watching this video, you should read chapter nine, social networking, e-commerce, and the web in your Experiencing MIS textbook, at least up to section Q7. That would be all the parts that cover social media. After watching this video, there are a few recommended MyLab MIS homework activities to help you review this chapter's content and study for the quizzes and final exam. Let's now begin by discussing Social Media Information Systems, or SMIS for short. But first, what is social media? Well, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with social media. In fact, probably far more so than my generation. But to give a formal definition, social media is the use of information technology to support the sharing of content among a network of related individuals or organizations. By related here, I don't necessarily mean familial type relationships, um, relationships between family members, but also individuals related by common interest or social circles. The content being shared can be almost any user-generated content, including blog posts, short messages, videos, pictures, or pretty much anything else that can be digitalized and shared electronically. Social media networks also enable communities of practice. These would be groups of people related by a common interest that may not necessarily meet or know each other outside of the social network. Some current examples of popular social media sites include Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, WhatsApp, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, Pinterest, Reddit, LinkedIn, WeChat, QQ, Discord, and so many more. The point here is that there's a lot of them, and for the most part, they all target their own market niches. So that brings us back to Social Media Information Systems, or SMIS for short. These are information systems for sharing content among networks of users. How is this different from just social media? Well, just like the difference between IT and IS, the difference between social media and social media information systems is that SMIS include the human element, the procedures and people, while social media just describes the technology, site, and network. Generally, the actors involved in social media fall into one of three roles, social media providers, users, or communities. Social media providers, such as Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, provide platforms on which users can share content. These platforms tend to target specific demographics or content niches. For example, YouTube is targeted at long format videos, Instagram photos, and Twitter short messages. Pinterest and LinkedIn, on the other hand, tend to target a specific demographic of user. LinkedIn is aimed towards people seeking employment and tends to have older users, mostly over 35. While well, Pinterest has a user base that is 77% female. The most popular of these providers currently is Facebook, now called Meta, which not only has billions of active users on their main Facebook platform, but also owns other popular social media sites and apps, including WhatsApp, Messenger, and Instagram. The next role are users. These are both the individuals and organizations that use social media platforms to share and view content. According to recent numbers by Data Reportal, We Are Social, and Hootsuite, there are over 4.5 million users of social media. That's more than half the population of the Earth now using social media, and the trend shows no signs of slowing down. For organizations, social media has become an important means of interacting and handling relationships with customers. We are seeing similar growth in companies embracing social media, 
with over 77% of Fortune 500 companies actively maintaining a Twitter account, over 70% with Facebook pages, and over 69% with YouTube channels. It's easy to see why businesses are so interested in social media, with half the Earth's population using it. We've moved from social media being a possible competitive advantage for your company to the point where not maintaining an active social media presence would put you at a significant competitive disadvantage, and that's something we want to avoid. The last role are communities. These are groups of users that share mutual interests that transcend familial, geographic, or organizational boundaries. These communities can be formally defined, such as Facebook groups on Facebook, subreddits on Reddit, or servers on Discord. Or they can be informal communities created simply by users tending to interact mostly with other users that share the same interests. The real power of communities comes with the ability for a user to amplify their voice or message. For example, if you tweet a message out to your friends in Community A, and they all retweet it to their friends in the communities they belong to, who in turn again share it to communities they're involved in too, we'll start to see exponential growth of people seeing that message. These may even be communities that cross network boundaries and exist on other social media sites without a direct connection to Twitter. The number of people that see that tweet or message grows exponentially until a critical mask is reached where there's no one left who is able or interested in receiving it. This is sometimes called going viral, and is yet another reason why businesses are so interested in social media. The ability to get their message or advertisement out to billions of people in a cheap and seemingly grassroots way is incredibly enticing. SMIS are comprised of the same components as any other information system. Recall from our first lecture that information systems are comprised of hardware, software, data, procedures, and people. And SMIS are no exception to this. However, what these components are can change a little bit depending on the role of the actor involved. The first component, hardware, for social media providers would be the physical network and computing infrastructure that supports the social media site and applications. These are commonly cloud-based and elastic due to the sheer size of the networks involved. For users and communities, the hardware would simply be the desktop computers and mobile devices used to connect to, view, and post on social media sites. Software for social media providers would be the server applications, DBMS, and other software systems that define the social network. Commonly, a mix of both relational and no SQL databases are used by social media providers, as the sheer amount of data and speed of the transactions are too much for conventional database management systems. And this is one of those rare cases where you might see a business create their own DBMS. For example, Facebook developed Cassandra, a NoSQL DBMS to power Facebook's search features, as no off-the-shelf solution could handle the sheer needs of the volume at the time. For users and communities, the software component would be the operating system run on their local computer or device, and the web browser or app they're using to connect to the social media site. The data for social media providers is any content, connection data, or metadata that's provided or extracted from users. For the users and communities, it would be the user-generated content, or UGC for short, that's created by the user themselves or shared by others in their community. Procedures for providers are the policies, rules, guidelines, and best practices used by their employees to keep the network running, dealing with any incidents such as users breaking the terms of service or interacting with organizations such as creating advertising deals. For individuals, these would be the informal and fluid processes by which they create, manage, and share content. For organizations and businesses, these tend to be far more formal and fixed, and are often described in a social media policy set by the organization that must be followed by all employees. They're aimed at achieving the organization's business goals and objectives, as well as minimizing any risk or liability. The last component is people. For providers, people would be the staff, employees, and contractors that run and maintain the network. For regular individuals, these would be the people that users interact with on social media and the communities they belong to. For businesses that use social media, the people involved are typically social media managers or at least employees that are trained in the organization's social media policies and procedures. So now that we know what social media and SMIS are, 
how can we use them to advance our organizational strategy and create a competitive advantage? Well, recall from Chapter 3 that organizational strategy must be tightly tied to your respective value chain. Value chains are networks of value-adding activities that add value to raw materials or products at each step in the chain. So how do SMIS fit into all this? And where might social media activities fall in the value chain? Are they primary activities or support activities? Recall that primary activities are activities that directly add value to products, such as manufacturing. And support activities only add value indirectly, like for example, your HR or IT departments. So where do you think activities that involve social media might fall on the value chain? Primary, support, or maybe something else? I'll give you a few seconds to think of an answer. And we're back. The answer is that social media activities are actually both primary and supporting activities. They're involved with most business activities and functions that you would perform in your business. And we'll take a closer look at how social media impacts each of them shortly. Social media fundamentally changes the balance of power between users and communities and organizations. It has both the potential for significant benefits and severe risks for a business using it, as there is a loss of control. No longer do businesses have complete control of their message. On social media, users often have just as much power to broadcast their message as corporations do, and this poses a significant risk if the message is negative for that business. Here we have figure 9.5 from your text, and it does a nice job of summarizing the role social media plays in the most common value chain activities. First activity here that we'll take a look at is sales and marketing. In the past, organizations manage relationship with customers using structured processes and traditional customer relationship management systems. Now, social CRMs provide a dynamic social media-based CRM process that allows each customer to craft their own relationship with the organization. Customers can not only search and view content created by the organization, such as blogs, wikis, and FAQ lists, but also take an active role in posting reviews, asking questions, and creating user groups focused on a particular product. If you recall from Chapter 7, one of the big goals of CRM systems for sales was identifying and retaining high-value customers. Social CRMs turn this around, and the customers with the largest impact on the business are no longer the ones that offer the highest value in terms of potential sales, but are now the ones that have the most influence on social media. It doesn't matter if the customer only represents a few dollars worth of sales, if they can influence others' perspective of your product through negative reviews or bad PR. The big risks here are loss of control, as users are now involved in the process, loss of credibility, if an employee posts something inappropriate or you respond to criticism poorly, and the potential for bad PR. The advantage is that if done correctly, customers basically sell your product for you, posting positive reviews to sites like Amazon and positive mentions on social media. Next up are customer support activities, and this is one of the more common ways we're starting to see businesses use social media. For example, Tech Savvy, a Canadian ISP, uses social media to provide customer support, including offering a Reddit subreddit and a Twitter account for customer service and support. This has the advantage of allowing customers to help other customers, as well as to publicly document issues like network outages in a way that are viewable by many customers, thus reducing support calls for the same issue. Another example is Public Mobile, a Canadian budget mobile virtual network operator, essentially a cell phone provider and they offer a community support form on their website which allows users to help other users for rewards, including discounts on their phone bill. The advantage for public mobile is reducing customer support costs and increasing customer loyalty. If you're helping out another customer with this product, you're probably going to have developed some loyalty for the company that's essentially giving you rewards to do it. Again, there are some risks with integrating social media to your customer support functions. Now the world can see that how you're performing customer support, and the common issues with your products. Some potential customers may be dissuaded from purchasing your products 
they see that existing customers are having significant issues with them. Second issue is that customers may provide incorrect or even dangerous support to other customers, and you could face some negative PR or even liability from their actions, especially if you're paying them indirectly for your discounts on their phone bills. Inbound and outbound logistic activities tend to see less integration with social media. However, its use is not unheard of. For example, during Hurricane Irma in the fall of 2017, many supply chains in the United States were severely disrupted. Social media was used to dispense news, provide updates, and address the ever-changing needs and problems between organizations. While this worked well during an extraordinary event, it does come with significant risks. The open discussion of logistic activities um, leads to a loss of privacy, and potentially damaging your competitive advantage. After all, you are openly discussing these issues in front of your competitors and business rivals. In terms of manufacturing and operation activities, social media is not normally used in the manufacturing process. But it is used in the product design phase, as well as for improving communication channels. For example, a company might use social media to crowdsource feedback on potential product designs or improvements to existing products. Risk here is that the feedback may be poor or manipulated. A famous example would be the social media campaign by Energy Sheets and Walmart to set up a Facebook poll to allow users to vote on the Walmart in the United States that Pitbull, a famous rapper, would visit to promote their new highly caffeinated product. Internet users banded together to vote for the most remote and ridiculous Walmart they could find. In fact, it ended up being in Kodiak, Alaska, just as a joke. To Pitbull's credit, he did eventually end up visiting that store. The risk here is that the internet could be unpredictable, and crowdsourcing from the public at large can have its complications. The next way social media is used in operational activities is by improving internal communications. Just like how there's public social media sites you may be familiar with, there are also private internal social media software, such as My Site and My Profile, that are part of Microsoft SharePoint. Shown on screen right now is an example screenshot of a SharePoint My Site profile for an employee. These internal social media networks allow for a business to easily share information in a fluid and dynamic way that still keeps the organization in control and maintains privacy. It can also allow managers to quickly find and connect with employees that have particular skills or sets of knowledge. Social media is also used between businesses to promote and sell their products to each other. For example, suppliers might post YouTube video walkthroughs of their factories and facilities and show off their products to try to encourage sales with manufacturers. One of the last activities that we'll discuss is human resource activities. And one of the big social media providers in this space is LinkedIn. LinkedIn allows for HR to recruit from a much larger pool of candidates, as they can access profiles of potential candidates who might not traditionally apply for the job post, but could still be open for work. For example, many people keep an active LinkedIn profile even when they're fully employed, and might be open to switching positions under the right conditions. Another way HR uses social media, and this might be more controversial, is to screen candidates based on what's posted under their social media profiles. Candidates that have pictures of partying or alcohol use might be passed on for candidates with a clean social media presence. In the programming world, social media sites like Stack Overflow or the social aspects of GitHub also allow candidates to show off their technical knowledge and allow hiring managers to assess their coding quality and depth of knowledge before even meeting with the candidate. Again, there are risks here. Viewing and screening candidates' social media could open up liability issues, as things like marital status or religion that may be commonly displayed on social media are not legally allowed to be considered as part of the hiring process. Similarly, this type of screening could be potentially error-prone and lead to poor hiring decisions. If you're throwing out potential candidates over superficial qualities discovered on social media rather than their ability or experience. Moving on now to the topic of social capital. To those of you familiar with the concept of capital, this might be a bit confusing. Normally, when we talk about capital, we're referring to things like physical capital, that is, goods, raw material, equipment, factories, and so on, or maybe even human capital, such as your investment in your employees and their knowledge and skills. But what's social capital? Well, social capital are investments in social relationships with the expectation of some kind of return. For you in your personal life, this might be treating your friends and family well so they'll help you and support you when you need it. 
In terms of business, these would be the investments in relationships with customers and suppliers with the expectation of marketplace returns, such as increased sales. We benefit from social capital in a number of ways. Strong relationships can provide information about opportunities, alternatives, problems, and other factors important to your professional or personal growth. For example, you might learn about new job openings from a friend, or your business might learn about a cheaper supplier from a close professional contact. The next benefit is influence. This would be the opportunity to influence decision makers who are critical to your success. For example, maybe you're applying for a job at a company and a close relative is an executive at this company. Their influence could have a big impact on the decision makers who will be deciding to hire you. For businesses, this influence could be over customer purchasing decisions. If you have a strong relationship with your customers, they might be more likely to purchase your products over suppliers. This can work the other way as well. Actions that have a negative impact on your social media capital with potential customers could influence them to purchase products from another company and avoid you. For example, if your company is known for hurting the environment or exploding third world labor, you might face backlash from your customers and damage your relationship with them. The benefit of social credentials is having access to a network of highly regarded contacts. Others may be more inclined to work with you if they believe critical personnel are standing with you or in your social circle and provide additional support or resources they would not have otherwise. And lastly is personal reinforcement. This would be the professional identity and image you develop from the company you keep. For example, if your friends are all bankers, financial planners, and investors, this may reinforce your identity as a financial professional to the outside world, and maybe even to yourself. The same is true of businesses. If you're making deals with and your partners with major suppliers and players in the industry, your business is far more likely to be taken seriously. So those benefits are all very well and good. But how do we make and increase social capital? Well, we could think of social capital as being impacted by three major factors, which are the number of relationships we have, the strength of those relationships, and the resources controlled by the entities involved in these relationships. For example, a massive network of close relationships, but don't contain many resources, is not as value as a small network of close contacts with vast resources. Similarly, a relationship with someone with vast resources it's not very useful if this is a very weak relationship. Maybe you just met a CEO once at a conference. This limited contact is far less likely to get you any real benefit compared to a strong relationship such as being best friends with the CEO of a certain business. It's also important that these resources here are relevant to your goals and objectives. Being best friends with a toy company executive is unlikely to help you find a job in the financial industry, for example. As a business, we can increase the number and strength of our relationships by maintaining an active social media presence across multiple platforms. For example, having a presence on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and other sites that might be relevant to your customers. The key here is that you want to be where your customers are. So having an active presence on a social media site like ResearchGate, a social media site for academics and researchers, would not make sense if you're a car company but could make sense if you're a publisher of academic journals and manuscripts or a supplier of lab equipment. Another big factor here is the frequency of interactions. Just like your personal life, if you stop hanging out with your friends, your relationships with them will weaken. And in the same way, if you stop actively interacting with your customers on social media, your relationship with them will weaken. A constant and active presence is required to maintain and improve relationships with your customers. This could be things like replying to customer support questions on social media as rapidly as possible, or frequently posting new content and videos about your product and responding to users' questions and comments about them. Last is encouraging comments, reviews, posts, and other forms of engagement from your customers. There's a reason why most YouTubers ask you to subscribe, leave a comment, and turn on notifications in every single video. And the reason for that is that it works. Reminding customers to post or encourage them in other ways, such as contests, encourages engagement and aids in strengthening these relationships. This can also help increase the number of relationships. Remember this figure from earlier in the video. If your customers are posting more about your products, 
That means that users and communities will see these posts and possibly share them further with other communities, leading to new relationships with new potential customers. A good example of a social media campaign like this was the Frito-Lay's Do Us a Flavor campaign, where they encouraged social media users to tweet or post about different possible chip flavors, and eventually to vote on the best tasting new flavor. Lay's even created a web app to allow users to create their own custom potato chip bag photo for their new flavor, and allowed them to post it on social media. This got users posting across different social media platforms about different flavor combinations. Some even intentionally bad as a joke, others more serious. But the point was that it got people talking about Lay's chips and eventually purchasing the winning flavors so they could vote on what the best finalist was. So at this point, a question you might have is, what's in it for the social media provider? Users get to use a free social media platform and businesses get to use platforms for various business activities we discussed. But how do social media providers benefit? Facebook, for example, has over 2.5 million users, all using the platform for free. The infrastructure to support this many users is extremely expensive. So how is Facebook making profit? If you're not paying, who's the real customer here? Well, if you're not paying and you're not the customer, that means you're the product. What I mean by this is the revenue model used by most social media providers is selling access to their users. There's incredible value in having control over a large network of users. And this is why most social media networks are offered for free, as they need to increase their membership as quickly as possible to be successful. The main method of monetizing a social network is through advertising. This includes banner ads, video ads, mobile ads, preferred ranking and search results, and the posting of classified ads. Advertisers, the real customers of social networks, prefer digital ads as they allow them to target to specific demographics. And they receive real-time feedback of how many users are seeing the ads, clicking on them, and how many actually follow through with the purchase. We call that conversion rate. Social media providers sell access to their users in this case by selling advertising space on their sites and in their mobile apps. The next monetization method is simply selling your users' data to a third party. You might not think this is a big deal. After all, on some social media sites, you might only be providing your email, username, and any content you wish to post. However, providers track everything and apply advanced data mining techniques to reveal far more about you than you might have thought. For example, YouTube collects information such as age and gender, even though you may have not directly provided this to them. Shown on the screen right now are the age and gender stats for this YouTube channel at the time of writing this video. And they also track things like the location you're watching from, the type of device you're using, whether it be like a desktop computer or a phone, the operating system you're using, and even things like how long you watch each video and the exact points where you stop it. And perhaps most disturbing, at least to me, is your search history. Shown here on the screen are the real searches that people in our class have made that they show to me as the channel owner. Now, for me, these are all anonymous. I don't know who's done these searches. Like, I don't know who searched for MacBook Air. However, Google, as the parent company of YouTube, does have this data on a per user level, so they know exactly who made that search for MacBook Air, for example. And this sort of data is extremely valuable to third parties that they might sell it to. So the reason why this data is so incredibly valuable to third parties is that they use it for things like market research and targeted advertising. For example, someone searched for MacBook Air, so they might start showing them our ads for laptop computers. There's also some searches in there for recipes, so third parties might see that and start generating more ads related to food products. So some companies even go as far as using this data to build psychological profiles of users to determine the likelihood of them purchasing certain products, voting for certain political parties, or how to best tailor their advertising to them as an individual. Cambridge Analytica, the company that was involved in a large-scale scandal in the USA for using unscrupulous means to collect Facebook data, on millions of Americans, has claimed that they have over 5,000 data points on each and every individual in the United States, and have used these data points to build psychological profiles on all of them. They mostly use these profiles to micro-target political advertising at voters in elections in Australia, India, Kenya, Malta, Mexico, the UK, and most notably in the United States during the 2016 presidential election. So the last revenue model, and this one's a little less scary, is the freemium model. This is where you offer a product for free, but also offer paid 
explore services or upgrades that complement that free product. For example, LinkedIn offers users an upgraded paid-for membership called LinkedIn Premium, which claims to improve your chances of getting hired by allowing you to message users that you're not actually connected to. It also allows you to see who's viewed your profile and giving access to LinkedIn courses. LinkedIn also has premium services for businesses to make it easier for them to find and hire candidates. Another example would be platforms like YouTube and Twitch, now allowing users to pay for premium subscriptions to content creators' channels, which offer perks such as custom emotes that can be used in the chat or other perks set by content creators. In this case, the income from the subscription fee is split between the content creator and the social media platform. So we touched on a little bit of some of the privacy issues with social media. And that leads us into our next topic of SMIS security, and more specifically, how we can attempt to address some of these security concerns posed by social media information systems. The first security concern we'll discuss are the risks posed by our own employees communicating on social media. Employees posting on behalf of the company could cause serious damage if they are to post inappropriate content or be seen as unfairly attacking customers who post valid criticism. This can lead to a negative public relationships and loss of credibility. Employees posting sensitive or confidential information is another concern, as is losing the ability to have a unified message to the public. The best way to deal with these concerns is through creating, publicizing, and enforcing a social media policy for your employees that defines an employee's rights and responsibilities when they're posting on behalf of the company. It's also important to train your employees in this policy and the correct use of social media. Here we can see figure 9.9 from your text, which details Intel's rules for social media engagement. Essentially, this is a high-level summary of Intel's social media policy for its employees. There are three core pillars here, and they are disclose, protect, and use common sense. By disclose, they mean be transparent. Use your real name and make it clear who you work for. Be truthful and yourself. By protect, they mean don't leak sensitive information or embarrass the company. And by using common sense, they mean make sure that your contributions are worthwhile, on topic, and rational rather than emotional. And make sure that you omit mistakes when you make them. Okay, back to discussing SMIS security concerns. Your employee's use of social media is not the only concern. User-generated content, or UGC for short, also poses significant risks as you don't have control over what external users contribute to your social media page. Unlike employees who can be subject to an employee social media policy, external users are free to do what they wish. This leads to problems such as the posting of spam or junk contributions that are completely off topic posting of inappropriate content or negative reviews, and what our textbook describes as mutinous movements. This can be seen as an extension of negative reviews, where a group of dissatisfied or disgruntled users work together to post negative comments about a business or to hijack their social media campaigns for their own purposes. This is sometimes called review bombing, and is common to see when social media users turn against an organization for some perceived wrong. So how do we deal with these problems? Well, there's three possible responses to this kind of negative UGC. They are leave it, respond to it, or delete it. The UGC we're concerned about is reasonable but negative criticism of our organization. Then often the best approach is to simply leave it where it is. Deleting it could be seen as censoring customers' valid criticisms and could lead to the company losing credibility, or worse, the start of a mutinous movement, as our textbook would put it. Another reason is to simply leave it is that keeping negative reviews can make the site seem less biased, and this will in turn makes the positive reviews seem more legitimate. There is a key distinction here, however. We are leaving negative reviews, but not ignoring them. Reasonable criticism should be taken seriously, even if you don't respond to it publicly, and we should use that feedback to improve our products and services. Responding to problematic UGC is a risky endeavor. If done well, it can show that your company takes customer concerns seriously and is working to improve. But if done poorly, it can quickly destroy any social capital you've built with your customers and lead to movements against your company. In general, it's best to only respond if you're actually doing something to address the criticism, such as offering the customer uh, some kind of solution to their problem, such as replacing their defective product, or publicly talking about how you're improving your procedures based on customer feedback. 
the absolute worst thing you can do is to argue or fight with the customers publicly. Remember, anyone can see your reply on social media, and an open conflict with a customer is only going to make your business look bad. A good way to put it is that you should never wrestle with a pig. He'll just get dirty and the pig will enjoy it. So people just like to complain and to get into fights online. And you have nothing to gain from engaging with them like this on their own terms. The last possible response is to delete the UGC if it's posted on a social media page you have control over. Now this should be reserved for only inappropriate, junk, and off-topic content. Removing valid criticisms and negative reviews will be perceived poorly by the public and will lead to a loss of credibility for your business. If you delete negative reviews, no one will believe that the positive reviews are legitimate as your site will be seen as heavily biased. A good way to prevent negative content from being posted in the first place is not to ask questions you don't want to hear the answer to. For example, with that case of energy strips and pitball, the Alaskan Walmart should never have been a possible option if they didn't want it to be a potential answer that they could get. However, they did handle this outcome well, by simply leaving it and going through with sending them to Alaska. In the end, their social media campaign going sideways actually ended up being beneficial as it generated far more positive publicity than it would have if it had gone to plan. Similarly, with the Lay's Do Us a Flavor campaign, they knew full well that their users would create inappropriate and disgusting flavor combinations using the app. Despite this, they made no effort to remove them or prevent them from being created in their app in the first place. And this was very much intentional, as the users sharing silly and ridiculous flavors still promoted the company and was essentially free advertising. So to quickly summarize, if in doubt, leave it up. If it's inappropriate, remove it. And if you can do something positive about it, respond. The last group of security concerns that social media poses are those that are internal to our organization. So far, we've only discussed the risk in terms of interacting with the outside public, but there's also risks from within the organization. The first of these risks are employees inadvertently increasing corporate liability. Employees posting inappropriate comments about other employees can open up the business to liability in terms of sexual harassment or creating a hostile work environment. There's also concerns with employees posting confidential or sensitive information, such as trade secrets, leaked product announcements, or private customer data. This is especially dangerous in fields like healthcare, where there are significant fines and penalties for mishandling of patient data. Again, these issues can be mitigated with proper social media policies, employee training, and actively monitoring your social media accounts. Another consideration is that innocuous comments and posts by employees can pose a security risk by leaking seemingly harmless information that's used to secure an organization's resources. For example, many systems use security questions such as date of birth, mother's maiden name, name of your high school, or the name of your first pet to reset your password if you lost it. Posting this kind of information on social media can make it easier to steal your identity and accounts. A similar issue is posting when you're going to go on vacation. This lets potential thieves know when you are not at home and they have the opportunity to break in without anyone being there. The last issue given by our textbook is reduced employee productivity. And the authors of our text claim that about 64% of employees visit non-work-related social media sites during the day. Now, I have no doubt that this statistic is true. In fact, it seems a little bit low. However, I think the textbook makes this out to be a bigger problem than it is in reality, and gives the false impression that this is something that you should actively try to prevent. The reason why I disagree is that current research shows that taking micro breaks, such as watching a short YouTube video, actually improves employees' mood and task engagement willingness, relieves psychological stress, and maintains task performance. So I'm basing this on a 2021 paper that I now have cited here on the screen. If your employees are still completing their assigned tasks in a timely fashion, attempting to ban social media or phones in the office will likely only reduce employee morale and waste your time trying to enforce these strict rules. And that brings us to the end of our discussion on social media. Stay tuned for part two of this video, which will cover the remaining topics of chapter nine, which is mainly e-commerce. For now, I suggest trying out some of those MyLab MIS activities for chapter nine, including the video quiz, which will talk a bit more about social media. Thank you for watching and have a great day.